The bitter truth about chemical reactions is that anything that can go forward can in principle go backwards. They are, in theory, reversible. It's easy, generally speaking, to control that reversibility, something that's not pointed out in most textbooks. But if A and B is turning into C and D, in theory, C and D can also go back to A and B. And oftentimes, this presents a huge impediment towards getting a reaction to go to completion. Every time it forms that product, it reverses itself, giving you what most would consider to be a lousy yield for the reaction. So we use these double arrows to imply chemical equilibrium. If you see a forward arrow, it's supposed to mean, in theory, that there is no equilibrium. Chemical equilibrium occurs not when the reaction is stopped, but rather when the forward rate equals the reverse rate. So if you have a very favorable equilibrium, and these can be measured using an equilibrium constant to show the degree to which it's going forward. Uh, if it's got a great uh, equilibrium constant, you get very little of this at the end, the reactant, lots of that. In either case, though, it gets to the point where uh, it's in an equilibrium between the forward rate and the reverse rate uh, um, occurring at the same pace and therefore you achieve equilibrium. So standard question, uh, when the chemical reaction is over, does the reaction stop? No, it just gets to this point of equilibrium. The equilibrium is defined, as we pointed out in the last slide, as the concentration of products divided by exponent, divided by reactants in moles per liter where the coefficients are raised to their exponents. This is simply how it's defined, and this works to give a nice value for the equilibrium constant. Uh, if you plot the concentration of them over time, for example, it looks like this would be the reaction of nitrogen plus hydrogen to make ammonia. This is the Haber process for the synthesis of ammonia. Over time, the concentration of the reactants goes down, the concentration of the products goes up, but notice that neither of them is um, gone. We end up with a little bit of each, and we have. And when, once this flattens out in terms of concentration over time, you've achieved your, achieved your equilibrium, and unless you do something external, which you probably should, uh, the reaction has stopped. In general, if the equilibrium constant K is less than 1, it's mostly reactants. If it's greater than 1, it's mostly products. And then you'll see here that in this case, you've got uh, a larger concentration of hydrogen than you do of products. So this does not look like a very good yield to me. Uh, and if it's mostly greater than 1, you got mostly products. And don't forget that we omit precipitates. Usually that means liquids and solids. So this only deals with the things that are in the system. And that's the big hint, obviously, for how to get a re reaction to go to completion, is simply remove the product as it's formed. So if you can get some of this stuff to kick out a solution, it'll then push the reaction forward, and it'll keep going. Uh, but that's a little bit about the bitter truth of chemical reactions. Let's continue a little bit. When does it show up? Well, as we pointed out in the first slide, there's usually three chapters devoted to this stuff. It happens when you have a reaction that does not form a precipitate, so it can go forwards and backwards. That's a nice description of it. Uh, for example, if those are all aqueous, you could have a chemical, you would have a chemical equilibrium situation. For weak acids and bases in solution, that doesn't mean them reacting. Weak acids or weak bases in solution, they dissociate, but not that much. And so there's an equilibrium between their dissociated component and their undissociated component. So nitrous acid dissociates just a little bit, and that's a chemical equilibrium situation. If you react a weak acid and a weak base, it reacts, but then it changes the concentrations of things, and then you've got uh, equilibrium once again. So nitrous acid and ammonia, uh, weak acid, weak base, that too should be a subscript, uh, form NO2- minus and the ammonium cation. Buffers, that is a acid and its conjugate base. So if you have acetic acid, uh, it simply exists in equilibrium with CO, uh, acetate anion, NH+. Normally, uh, this stuff, therefore, uh, will resist a change in pH if you have a solution that contains both acetic acid and the acetate anion, which you can, you know, 
prepare. You can have sodium acetate, for example. That's a buffer solution. We'll have more to say about that in the next chapter. And solubility. If you throw something that's weakly soluble in water, like lead sulfate, that should be a small b, or chalk, or something like that, it will dissociate just like the weak acid did, but only a little bit, and therefore you have an equilibrium situation. Okay, we'll continue on the next uh, screencast with some fun facts about equilibrium.